now. This is our behavioral health track. Our session will be focusing on the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians syringe services, a harm reduction approach. I'd like to introduce our presenter, Vicki Bradley, and I'll read her bio. Vicki is the Secretary of Public Health and Human Services for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, where she is also a member. Vicki received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Western Carolina University and a Master of Public Health at Lenore Rain University. She has worked in healthcare for 30 years and has worked in tribal public health for the last 17 years. She served as a Certified Addictions Registered Nurse Supervisor with the Indian Health Services at the Unity Healing Center, a Community Health Nurse, a Wound Care Supervisor, and Tribal Public Health Operations Director. During her 17 year tenure with the EBCI and as its Secretary of Public Health and Human Services, she has led the initiative and the EBCI to assume the authorities for developing their own human services programs and then consolidated and expanded services to create an integrated public health and human service division. Vicki focuses on improving population health by building and sustaining quality results-based accountability best practice standards, as well as she's an active member of the National Indian Health Board, Tribal Public Health Accreditation Advisory Board, and the United South Eastern Tribes Health Committee, as well as a member of the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. And I will get her presentation up. It appears we we just have one person in the session. Am I correctly seeing that? Yes, for now, yes. Out of courtesy, um, Marissa, is that her name? I'm wondering, Stephen, if we want to go through with a full presentation or if we would give her the option if she would want to join another session that had more people in it. I don't know if that would be appropriate or not, but it seems like it would be a respectful thing to do. Yeah, Marissa, if you want to, I'll let you speak for yourself. Um, one of the things that we have noticed, Vicki, people do tend to come in late. Um, so I can, leave, I'll leave that up to you. And then if Marissa has anything. This is Marissa. Um, Vicki, I would love to hear your presentation if you don't mind. Sure, I'm glad to do it. I mean, glad to. Just wanted to give you that option. Thank you. All right, we'll get started. Everyone can see the screen? Yes. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you, Vicki. So, uh, so good morning and, and thanks for joining and, and we'll make this informal. So if you have questions, you're welcome to, to stop or we can hold those until the end. Um, but I will just ask uh, Gabby to go ahead and advance the slide. Sorry. Just a so we're going to talk about harm reduction, um, what the key principles are, define what serene services are, and understand why, talk about why this was the best practice option for EBCI. And then we will also identify next steps for your community. In the midst of that, we're going to talk about legislative actions also and how to gain buy-in from stakeholders. Thank you. Next, please. So harm reduction, I think it's important to understand harm reduction as a conceptual framework rather than just one thing. There are a lot of, lot of definitions out there. There's not any one universal definition and it can be applied. Harm reduction has been applied for many, many years. We just didn't call it that. Um, but today we're gonna talk about it in terms of syringe services. Um, and how policies, actions, practices, programs can be geared toward harm reduction. Uh, and Gabby, if you would play the video, I think this just gives a nice introduction um, 
from the National Harm Reduction Coalition on how people feel about harm reduction. Well, that sound is not playing for me. Is it playing for you guys? I'm not hearing sound either. No, there's no sound. We can forego that. The reference is on the slide deck if we want to. Uh, I can I can talk about that. Okay, so basically harm reduction. Um, like I said, there's no universally accepted definition but it has its roots in drug use and it can be applied to a lot of risk behaviors. Incorporates a spectrum of strategies, including safer use, managed use, abstinence, and meeting people where they're at. I think that's really important. I will say when we embarked on learning about harm reduction in 2015, it was a fairly new concept to me, even though I knew that, um, I mean, I knew what harm reduction was. I thought, you know, there's been a lot of application to harm reduction over the years. The um, Just Say No campaigns and the DARE programs, those were all harm reduction, right? And so what we also learned in understudying with some folks that were harm reduction specialists and if, if your team decides to go this route, I would encourage you to get training. There's actually certified trainers in harm reduction. Is that um, harm reduction kind of accepts some ways of using are safer than others. Um, it addresses the conditions of use along with the use itself. We understand that drug use is very complex. It's a very multifaceted issue. Uh, and there are a lot of behaviors that go from abstinence to cutting down on use. Uh, it acknowledges there's a safer way of using drugs. It acknowledges there's a safer way of having sex. Harm reduction is often applied to things like sex trafficking as well. And it endorses and promotes quality of life. It calls for very non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources. So it encompasses a full range of health and social services and practices. It applies to illicit and licit drugs. Doesn't differentiate. Thank you. Next slide. All right, so what is it not? Sometimes it's easier to talk about what harm reduction is not. So it does not enable drug use or highest high risk behavior. There is a misconception about syringe service programs. We'll talk about that a little later about how um, we enable in these programs people to use or we let them know that it's okay to use and it doesn't. So it doesn't encourage drug use, does not dismiss abstinence programs. It does not dismiss MAT models or other viable options for recovery. And it does not focus on changing a person. It accepts people where they are. Um, it is not pro-drug. It's not anti-drug. It is more of a neutral um, stance. It's concerned with reducing harms of drug use, not focusing on treating so much. Um, I will say that harm reduction is not about careless or in different approaches, it is very, very evidence-based. It is very pragmatic. It is very cost-effective. And you, when you compare that to the cost of HCV treatment or HIV treatment. Thank you, next slide. What does it look like? So it looks like many different models. This is a model that 
that I've created based on what we see here in Cherokee. So this is kind of how we operate. You'll see that it's very iterative, it's circular, not linear at all, because we don't know when someone presents in our program, if they are there for support, if they're there for nurturing, if they're there to find a bit of hope, if they're there just to get syringes and leave. So I think the big thing that we focus on is equitable access. It is very easy. I will be the first to acknowledge that when we started thinking about opening a syringe service program, I thought we will see this type of people. And it's not. It is all facets of our community. We see the very impoverished and homeless, and we see those who are uh, doing very well and have an established place in society. And so we are about equitable access and non-judging anyone that walks through the door. Um, it is place-based care. What do I mean by place-based care? It is, um, it happens in the field, it happens in the home, happens in the community. We are fortunate enough to have a syringe services dedicated standalone space, but we meet folks where they are and thus we have mobile units and that kind of thing. Uh, it's about education more than anything, helping folks to understand that we're there to reduce their harm. We're not there to judge, we're not there to coerce, as I mentioned earlier, but we are there to reduce harm in their lives. We provide advocacy, we provide linkages, we provide referrals, we provide testing. Um, we refer for individual counseling and support. We do not provide that there. Um, we make it very clear, we're not your counselor, but we can help you access when you're ready. And more than anything, it's about acceptance and love. And our people come by sometimes just to say, just needed somebody that, that doesn't judge me, just needed to hear from someone that cares about me. So that's kind of what our framework looks like. Thank you, next slide. Vicki, I just wanted to mention that Stephen and Marissa both said that this was a very great graphic. Oh, thank you very much. All right, next. Next, we're gonna talk about principles of harm reduction. Now, this also is not a universal approach. There are a lot of principles. These are the principles that jump out at us for the last couple of years that we base our services on. So let me just clarify that as well. Um, our approach is that we accept folks for better or worse that licit and illicit use of drugs are a part of our world. And we choose to minimize harmful effects, not condemning the person. I think that's really important. And you will know in one of these programs, people immediately, they're afraid to come in. And the first thing they want to know is, am I going to be judged? Or is this just another person to say, you need to get in treatment, you need to stop using. And so when they realize that's not what we're doing, we're there to help them, help identify uh, things that might cause them harm, teach them a safer way to use. They're just very grateful and appreciative. We accept that quality of life definitions for individuals and community are very diverse and they don't always include complete, complete abstinence. What I view as quality of life, may not conform with what another person views as quality of life. So our criteria for, for defining successful intervention is not always cessation of drug use. It affirms people who use drugs. It recognizes that realities of social determinants of health, adverse childhood experiences, social inequities, all those things affect how people deal with drug-related harm. And so I give this example, if, if you grow up in a home where sexual assault or abuse happens to every child in the family, that may be your norm, even though that seems very odd to another person. And so we can't um, transfer our, our beliefs and norms 
onto our participants. We have to meet them where they are and let them help define what a successful intervention is. And then it also gives people who use drugs a voice in programs and policies. I think this is really important in harm reduction rather than um, us saying, this is what we're going, we're going to do and this is how it's going to work. Uh, I like to say, let he who sweeps the floor choose his broom. And so they help us define our policies and help us determine what success looks like. Thank you, next slide. So let's talk about syringe. In this framework, we're talking about a syringe service program as a harm reduction model. There are many harm reduction models. So what is a syringe service program? A lot of people used to call them needle exchange programs. Uh, this is a little bit more um, an accepted use, accepted terminology now. So we refer to ours as a syringe service program or an SSP. They distribute sterile syringes. Yes, we do that, but it's much more than that. We also distribute safe use supplies, <clears throat> such as saline, cookers, tourniquets, uh, cotton balls to draw the drug up in. Um, and then more importantly, we also distribute some things that we never thought we would distribute, and that's water and crackers and uh, non-perishable food items and hygiene kits because our participants, a lot of them don't have access to these things. And so we try to help them in other ways as well. And we have great partners that contribute to that. We provide education. We provide education about how to use safely, how to have safer sex, how to assess your skin for infection, how to assess your body for infection, how to, how to do a lot of things, how to access housing and a primary care physician and a lot of things. We do testing. We don't do daily testing. We, do, uh, we have a linkage with our North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Infectious Disease Branch and they come about once a month and do testing. And if someone wants the HCV testing and HIV, and we just tell them, we assume that you're going to want to be tested for this. So when you're ready, let us know. And we connect them with a primary care provider. We provide a lot of linkages, linkages to housing and food. And we have done really innovative out of the box thinking with food, with our tribal food distribution or what was we previously called the commodities program. We have had them access food sources through USDA of non-perishable items that people that use this program can get rather than getting fresh fruits and vegetables that may need cooked, for instance, or frozen food that may need cooked. So they may get the vegetables and rather than getting eggs and things, they may get um, cans of ravioli. So you can do really creative things. And of course we aim to reduce fatal overdoses by distributing naloxone. These programs, are proven to reduce HIV and HCV infection rates for about, about 50%. We also know that about 68% 68 per, 68 reduction in needle stick injury to law enforcement and communities with needle exchange, syringe exchange programs. This is the statistic that I love. Although we don't encourage or coerce people into getting treatment, research consistently shows that people are five times more likely to enter drug treatment if they participate in a syringe service program um, than non-participants. We recently opened a methadone MAT program in addition to our Suboxone here in our community. And I think immediately nine uh, people that joined the MAT program were learned about the program and referred from our syringe service program. So great linkages. Thank you. Next slide. What do these services not do? I think this is important. They do not increase illegal drug use, although they get a lot of um, accusations that we do. Research shows that syringe service programs do not increase illegal drug use, they actually decrease it in communities. They do not encourage drug use. 
they do not coerce or threaten people to abstain from using drugs. This is really important in this realm of healthcare. And we do not provide daily therapy. However, there are times that we co-locate therapists in our program and say, we have a therapist here today. Uh, if you'd like to see them, this is where she's at. And we make it so that it's easily for them to just go in without us making a big deal that they're there. So we've talked about what it's not. We've talked about what they don't do. Uh, let's go a little deeper and say, why did we do this at Cherokee? Next slide, please. So North Carolina passed legislation in 2016 for syringe service programs, fortunately, because our conversation started in 2015. And we actually had a resolution passed by a tribal council member in 2017 that directed our division to develop a syringe service program. We knew that approximately 775,000 Americans report having injected a drug in the past year. We know that about two and a half percent of any population, according to the World Health Organization, are injecting drugs at any time. And so that would have been a significant portion of our community. We knew that we had people injecting drugs because we had a huge syringe little problem in our community. We know that these programs reach people who often inject drugs and they really perform um, connections and linkages with your marginalized populations. All the research shows this is very evidence-based programs, that they are safe, they're effective, and they are cost-saving, not cost-saving. <laughs> Sorry about that typo. But the cost of treating one person with HIV compared to um, running a program is significant. They don't, they do reduce the transmission of viral hepatitis, HIV, and other infections. I'll show you some statistics from our program in a bit. They support public safety. Uh, research shows that new users of SSPs are five times more likely to enter drug treatment. Like I said, um, let me talk about legislation for a minute. So we did have a resolution passed to start the program, but we quickly realized that we needed another piece of legislation on limited immunity. And so what is limited immunity? We passed our limited immunity resolution in uh, two months after we got the directive to open the program. And basically it is, including the syringe exchange authorization is a provision that protects program employees, volunteers and participants from being charged with possession of syringes or other injection supplies, including those with residual amounts of closed controlled substances. If the syringes or supplies were obtained or returned to the syringe program, it does not provide protection for people stopped while holding illegal drugs or holding paraphernalia not obtained from their syringe exchange. So what does this look like in real life? If you're stopped or an individual is stopped that's a participant in our community and has residual uh, and has paraphernalia for injecting drugs on them, and they have one of our cards from our program that says that they are a participant there, then they are granted limited immunity and can't be charged with that. I think that's really important for communities that are considering uh, starting a syringe services program. So in 2015, CDC's National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System found that more syringes distributed by the number of people who inject drugs in a geographic region, the more likely the people who inject drugs in that region are to dispose of those syringes safely we distribute a lot of syringes. We don't often tell our community the number because it would just really blow their cap, but we emphasize that we have well over a 90% return rate, which is significant. Um, I mentioned before, syringe service programs are associated with 50% reduction in HIV and hep C, and we're seeing about that same rate here. And, um, they really serve to bridge a linkage between MAT programs. Thank you, next slide. 
So let's look at our data, EBCI and hepatitis C. So when we started, um, let me just jump right down to that bottom slide. You're gonna see that our numbers have significantly decreased since 2015. Well, what happened in 2015 when you see that spike there of 110 cases, about six and a half percent of our active user pop has ever been diagnosed with hep C. 3% are currently infectious. We were at one point over 8%. So in 2015, we really started talking about harm reduction in our community. We started talking about how to dispose of needles, how to clean your needles, that kind of thing. And then um, our numbers, our incidents each year was really high. And we opened the very beginning of 2018 with a soft opening. And at the end of that year, you can see we closed with our incidents um, dropping a 73 uh, new cases compared to 110. So we were getting close in that first year to dropping about 50%. And then in 2019, uh, 67 and 2020, 60. So we were right at 50% of where we were at our peak. And so over half of these with current high viral loads are between the ages of 25 and 36. We know that there was over a 400% increase in hepatitis C cases in that age group in the United States in 2010. And so this, this is our, I mean, this is our, community. This is our people who are going to be taking care of us. So we had to do something different. And this was what alarmed our tribal leaders and directed us to start something. We knew that Scandinavian countries have been doing this for years and it was a best practice. Um, and so they wanted us to do something uh, to decrease hepatitis C in our community. Thank you. Next slide. So this is ever diagnosed with HCV. All are either no longer infectious or they are chronic. So this is not current, but you're looking at the ages. Just wanted you to see once again, a different look at how that age group, um, just really that, that bell curve there, that epi curve really hits that, that young age group is, is who is being diagnosed. And we know that without treatment, without intervention, of course, this could be a fatal disease. Thank you, next slide. So what we knew about the issue um, was that the rates of HCV and EBCI increased exponentially between 2014 and 2018. 6% uh, of our user population's ever been diagnosed. This one directly impacted us and that heroin deaths in North Carolina rose 565% in those years prior to us making this decision to do this program. Um, our overdose rates increased exponentially between 2014, 2018. And um, 2014, I think, was our highest year. But during that time, we had 131 substance abuse-related deaths, 13% of all of our deaths. And the syringe litter was just really visible and horrible in our community. Um, all right, let's move to the next one. All right, so this looks at our poisoning and overdoses. Um, not all of the 2017 data was available in ODMAP, but we started using ODMAP in 2017. And you can see it tracked in real time um, the number of overdoses in our community. We still use ODMAP, encourage teams to do it. It's very effective. You can see we peaked, uh, had 16 deaths in June of 2017 in one month alone. Our community was hurting. I mean, we were, every family is affected. And then we've had some peaks. We typically see peaks in June and December during our distribution. But interestingly, May 2020, we were under a stay-at-home order. And you can see this, the mental health effects was devastating. Um, Stephen, I see your question. Do you know what the association with the month of May would be? Um, 
in that year, um, it was actually June and not May. And that was, that's per capita distribution. If you look at May and December, uh, I mean, June and December, it peaks every year. And so we've started implementing some strategies to really talk about that and to discourage and to do some education through our syringe program, like distributions coming up. Remember, uh, the drug dealers are gonna load their shots heavier during that time to try to get you to buy more. And so you are more likely to overdose. And we started doing some things like that and seeing a little bit of a trend down. If you can look in December 19, we trended way down. And then in December 20, we trended down a little bit. So those things are working. Um, so we have, we do distribute naloxone uh, in our program and all of our public safety use it as well. Thank you, next slide. So it's not just syringes. These programs are not just about of syringes. You can see all the things that we do. We reduce infections, we reduce fatal overdoses, we engage hard to reach populations, we support individuals, reduce stigma, all of those things. But we, these programs have a responsibility to do other education like safer injection practices, prevention, preventive health measures. We talk about smoking cessation as being a safer practice safer sex practices, mental health services, and then um, other things that affect our population. We hear all kinds of things from our population. Um, these programs lower numbers of contaminated needles in the community. I'm gonna talk to you about another uh, project that we did through this program with community kiosks in just a minute. Uh, we reduced drug-related behavior increase access to drug treatment referral services. We do what we call red carding in our program. And so we tell people, even though we don't coerce them, we believe at some point you will choose to do something different in your life and you may get tired of, of injecting drugs. When you make that decision, and we think you will, um, at any time that you're ready and you're just tired and don't wanna do this anymore, uh, let us know and we will red card you. And red carding means that you get a fast pass to detox. And so they take that red card directly to our uh, crisis stabilization unit or the ER on Lanishki outpatient. There's a variety of places and they can say, uh, I'm ready. And everyone knows what that red card is and they immediately get processed for detox. And so that's worked really well. And we've had a number of people do that. So you get real creative and innovative so that you can make it easy access to get treatment when they're ready. We have also um, had pregnant um, individuals, participants, and we can get them into care really quickly through this program. Thank you. All right, what we see. So as of August, 2021, we've had roughly 800 participants visit our syringe pro program since February of 18th. Now I'm gonna qualify this and say, these are approximate. Now this is why in the past, when I talk about this program, I have real hard numbers and we're working on that. But as most of you know, we had a cyber attack in December of last year uh, of 2019. As a result, our database in syringe service program crashed and we were not able to retrieve that. So sadly, that was lost. On a positive note, we had all the hard copies of all of our intake forms. And so now uh, we are building our own database and uh, it is actually built, but it's just taking time to put in uh, three and a half years of data. and. They assured me it would be in by um, August 1st, and then there was another glitch in getting the data. And so I didn't want to give real numbers. I can give approximate based on um, what we know from our manual reports. And so we will update this very soon and have really, really solid data. But what we know, um, is that we have had over 800 participants. Now that's much greater than two and a half percent, right? 
Uh, why is that? We're in rural Western North Carolina. We're a target for drug dealers and they work at work our community just like retail. So our average age of our participant is 31 years old. Our average age that our participants start using alcohol or drugs is 18. We have roughly 48% females and 52% males. That has ran pretty consistent since we've opened. We've distributed over six and a half, 650,000 syringes since the program started. And we've had close to 570,000 returned. So 88%, and you're like, all right, where are those others going? Doesn't mean they're going on the street. It just means that they may be disposing of them in ways that we've taught them. And there are a number of places they can take them. Um, we just done our annual report. And for 2020, we were at a 98% return rate. Um, we're not sure if the stay at home order affected that. And we really drilled down into that. But one thing we did this year that we hadn't done before is all of our staff were uh, peer specialists, certified peer specialists. And so they really call our participants on their behavior. They can't um, fake it with them. And I think that's made a huge difference. We've had over 15,000 visits from participants. Um, meth and heroin are our top reported drug use. In our community, meth seems to be more popular. I think it's cheaper. People manufacture it more locally and they actually inject it. And then 33% report opioid misuse of licit drugs. And so um, they're buying them on the street or wherever. The next one is just something that touches my heart every time I talk about it and that we have distributed over 10,000 naloxone kits through this program, but we've had over 900 100 reversals reported to our syringe program. That's 900 saved lives, folks. 900 people would likely have died without naloxone in this program. That's significant to me. Um, there was a chat. Wanda just asked a question, I noticed. Let me just pull that up. Um, does the average age of use correlate with graduation from high school? We don't know that, Wanda, we really don't. Um, what we know is that any survey that we have done, and we have done some really cool surveys with this program, our participants are very responsive if we wanna drill down. I think we have one of the few uh, community-wide ACE surveys, and it was done primarily with the respondents from this program to get a baseline of what ACE scores are in our community. Um, we're not sure, we're just not sure. You know, our children used to get their per cap distribution at 18, but they don't anymore. That's staggered distribution now and they only get a very small portion and doesn't get it all until they're 25. I think that could have initially had some impact. Um, we're just not sure that would, you know, that's a good question. We have some as young as 12 started to use that they remember. Uh, I think our oldest participant is in his 80s. So, um, yeah. All right, let's move to the next slide. To share that Marissa said that that's impressive that you have these numbers. Despite oh, thank you. We, we have the numbers that you will see uh, in about 30 to 60 days are really much more, I mean, very, very detailed. The database that we've created uh, on our platform is actually a multi-user database that we use, we call Hopewell, and we're deal building out different hubs of it for different programs. And it's just really amazing what we're getting. And our participants are very forthcoming with their information. So overdoses by naloxone administered. Um, so if you look at our OD map, this is some great detail. I don't know how interesting it would be to you, but for those of you that are interested in ODMAP, we thought this was interesting. So when our first responders key this in real time, you can see um, the number of overdoses that no naloxone was used, that a single dose was used, that multiple doses were used. The point of this is to say, 
our public safety is using naloxone and empowering them with using it has made a tremendous difference in our community. You can get naloxone from our program, North Carolina uh, uh, Harm Reduction Office was very, very generous. Our first 5,000 doses came from them. We were able to purchase all of our other doses with our CDC collaborative grant monies on opioid reduction and strategies. All right, next slide. This is our kiosk. We now have 27 throughout the community. We did this to help a few things. Um, our participants, we encourage them to bring their sharps to our facility. They have to bring in syringes to get syringes. It's not a one-for-one -one exchange, but they have to bring in, they get, it, it's kind of based on the number they bring in, but uh, we placed these in June of 2019. To date, we've received approximately 188 pounds. What does a pound look like? So a pound of syringes is about 133 syringes. Um, so about 25,000 syringes. So we know there are still a lot of people that don't use our program. And we have a surrounding region that use these drop boxes. And so it really helps clean our community. We located them in some very strange places. We put them in every community. We put them in commercial areas, but we also put them in very remote areas like on riverbanks that you don't even see from the road that we know were hot shot areas for people who inject drugs and they're using them. We, we still have some litter, but certainly not like we did. And you can see uh, the locations of them in the little bitty tiny map in the corner. You can't really see it, but we measure by community and location. And we, so we know where um, syringes are being returned at the highest rate. We get a few plastic bottles where they've put their syringes in plastic bottles, but not many because that top uh, drop box is, is just very, very narrow. It doesn't let a lot of, doesn't let trash in. All right, uh, next slide. What we know, our people rely on this program. They know when we're closed and when we're open, all our folks have Facebook and if we have to modify our hours, they're not happy, um, but they rely on us for information sharing. We know when there's bad drugs on the street and we pass it through this program because our participants will come in and say, there's fentanyl and you need to let people know. And so that reduces the amount of overdoses. We share information about endocarditis uh, because of bad drugs on the street. There's a lot of things we share. Um, we talk about, we give a ton of referrals. Uh, we do health assessments of their wounds, get them connected with care. And we just give a lot of support, hope and love. So who can visit our program? Uh, people who inject or otherwise use drugs, people on prescribed opioid pain management who may have questions and want naloxone, people who keep prescription or non-prescription opioids in their home and want naloxone in case someone in their home uh, gets, you know, unintentionally overdoses, um, friends and family of people who have people who inject drugs in their home and they want to keep clean supplies in their own home. Um, people who engaged in other high-risk stigmatized health behaviors, including sex, sex work, sometimes visit our program. Um, people who use syringes to administer prescribed or non-prescription medication, including hormones and steroids, often come for syringes. People looking for safer sex supplies. People interested in case management or referrals. People interested in volunteering. There's a lot of people visit our program, and for a lot of different reasons. But the, the theme that we have is we are here, this is your program, and we are here to keep you healthy until at which time you choose, if you ever do, to make the decision to stop using drugs. And so um, with that, um, we feel like we're successful. And that concludes my presentation. I'm totally open to taking any questions that any of you may have. Our program is located. Uh, Wanda, you know where um, 
the hospital is just down the hill where Public Health and Human Services building is. We just opened a new program last year, built a new facility uh, on our Public Health and Human Services campus. So it's directly adjacent from our administration building. It's about a thousand square foot facility. It's not huge, but it, it does the job. We're very fortunate. Uh, we use um, CDC funding to procure contract staff to help support this program. So those funds will not purchase syringes, but they will purchase naloxone and they purchased our mobile units. So there's a lot of funding available. This program, people always ask, what does it take to run a year? And it's about $800,000 a year for operational expenses. Uh, Tribal Council initially was about was split down the middle. We had some that just weren't sure. We had some that were over the top in support. Um, and we had some that were that were quite a sale and we still have one or two that have never been sold and they they will never buy. So we, uh, you know, the saying goes, we, we focus on those that we can win and those that are standing on the fence and those we know we'll never get, they just have accepted that we're there, um, but for personal beliefs. Um, some of our greatest supporters are our faith-based organizations. They donate hygiene products and, um, I tell this story, I have a brother uh, who is an opioid addict and my elder mother, uh, who is an elder in the community said she, and she who is a very, very devout um, Baptist woman said, I don't understand it. I don't know that I even like it, but what I do know is if this program keeps my son breathing, then there's always hope. But the instant he stops breathing, there's no more hope. And I think that captured it more than anything was we are there to, to keep people safe and healthy as we can until at which time they would like to, to make a difference, make a change. So. Um, How long have we had the program? Uh, we opened in the spring of 2018 with a soft opening. Um, yeah. So and, and about three years. Wanda asked, have you been approached by other tribal nations interested in your program and asking assistance in creating one in their area? And would you be open to this? Sure. We are actually doing a project right now, Wanda, uh, through USET with Passamaquoddy and have shared all of our, we have a kit put together for opening this program. We just had uh, Chief Hoskins from Oklahoma bring a whole contingency of 20 people to this program because Oklahoma just passed the law to allow syringe service programs for the first time. And so we have shared all of our policies, startup documents, legislation, everything. And so we're, we're totally open to hosting people to take a look at this. We were very fortunate in that when we started, we went to the greater Louisville area syringe exchange program, Louisville, Kentucky, and spent three days um, understudying and just working in that program. We took a team of five and I learned more doing that. And I would encourage anyone that's going to do this to do that. We're welcome to that. Our participants are welcome. We just don't like to bring a team in uh, because we're small um, without advance notice. And then we allow one or two people at a time to work alongside our, our team. But when we tell Participants, you know, we have someone visiting and they would like to be a part of your exchange today because they want to do this in their community. They're always open. And the exchange only lasts less than 90 seconds, typically, unless they are asking for other support issues. So, yeah, we're totally open. It, it's, it's been a really good thing for our community. And it connects people to health care. You know, it's surprising this program, even though we're outside of the hospital, I don't think it would have been effective if it was in the hospital or in behavioral health. That sends such a message that we're here to get you clean and get you sober. Uh, I think it is a public health program. Um, and I, I, that's what I told the Cherokee Nation, they were gonna embed it in their behavioral health program. I said, I don't think it'll be successful. I might be wrong, but you gotta build credibility, credibility somewhere where people are very non-judgmental. And I like to say my public health team is, is that, you know, manage them up because they do such a superb job. But sure, we're, we're glad to help anyone. 
So, Vicki, I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to put this in chat. Um, I, my brain is going in a lot of different directions, and um, I really, uh, I knew that this program was being, uh, was located at Eastern Band, and that it was being quite successful. And, of course, when you drive through the area, you can see signs, you know, and we visit, my family visits that area quite often when we can. But I find it quite interesting when you were talking about your kiosk and where those were located, uh, especially like when you mentioned the riverbanks and those kind of things. Um, that tells me that um, your staff has really uh, taken an, an, an initiative to fully understand the people, your citizens that you are um, having to come through your doors. And of course, with any type of program, that is 100% important. The second thing um, that I think um, I find quite interesting is um, the mentality um, of uh, understanding that not all people that come through the program are going to stop their practices and being able to relate to them and get on the same plane with them. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that you have had to do uh, even though your staff may have that mindset um, or you may have had some that weren't quite there that you had to, um, you know, flush out that kind of thing. But I would think extensive training would have been uh, provided to your staff to get them to the point of really understanding what is necessary to be able to share um, you know, whether it's your facial expressions or your body language or whatever, all of those different things really speak to someone when you're standing there, you know, engaging with them and he helping them to understand the importance of all that. Yeah, I think it's real important. I mean, we, we did not start with peer support specialists. We started um, in other areas. Um, you know, we use nurses initially. And um, so peer support specialists really make a difference with the participants because they know that those folks have been there. Yeah, so it's, um, it, it, it's, been, a, it's been a journey. Um, like I said, it's, you know, and the, the whole questionnaire, everything's scripted, you know, they get the exact same questions every time, every time a participant comes in. And Stephen has a question. Um, I wanted to also ask, um, as I'm excited to have the privilege to do in the future to shadow your EBCI syringe exchange program, you had mentioned in regards to a certified training in the beginning, is that only for clinical staff or is that also for people that would be um, promoting this syringe exchange program? Yeah, we, we don't have a certified harm reduction counselor, uh, someone, but the Greater Louisville Exchange, their director was certified in harm reduction. He came here, we actually contracted him to come and do harm reduction training for our police. Public safety was the hardest sell. Our police fought this program. They felt like we were in, encouraging drug use, um, but crime, petty crime has gone down when this program opened um, because syringes are expensive. And when someone uses syringe for six weeks, it is really, um, you know, costly and risky. But he was able, the guy's name was Matt, he was able to get on a level with the police officers and help them understand where we couldn't. And I think it was because he was external. You know, he didn't have a dog in the fight. He just gave them facts uh, where we were selling. And so they felt like maybe, I don't know, I can't speak for them. I think maybe they felt like they couldn't trust us because we were saying anything to get buy-in. And he was just like very matter of fact with them. And Stephen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, Gabby. So this really isn't a question. It's more of a comment, Vicki. Um, you know, this presentation was one of the first presentations that I heard when I joined USET in 2018, and I was blown away. Um, mm -hmm. And I continue to be blown away each year with the updates and numbers and how you guys 
are exceeding national benchmarks um, and have seen a reduction in, in so many different rates. It's just amazing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I know that it's a lot of hard work and, um, you know, sharing the best practices with Passamaquoddy, I think, is one uh, good advancement in, in USEP being able to share those resources throughout um, Indian country to make a difference in other communities. So um, as always, you know, congratulate you on all of the success that you've had with the program. And it's just amazing. Thank you very much. I have some great team members. I have a, uh, my Salagi public health manager took a real personal interest in this program and she has nurtured it and nurtured it. Um, and I, I think I've told the story in the beginning. I, I worked every week, at least a couple of hours a week in the program. I don't have the luxury of doing that now, but I certainly learned a lot from our participants. And um, we deal with probably the most disenfranchised population in our community in this program. And yet the gratitude they show, uh, and they will tell you very quickly that they're like, this is the only program that treats me like a human. And man, that that will really touch your heart when you work with these people. So we feel like it's successful. And we have seen, um, I will be really interested when we get our database back up, because then we will know exactly how many people have uh, gone to treatment from this program. So I know in the first two years, I think we'd had nine. That's significant to me. Yeah. One well, of our workers you. actually was a participant in this program that works for us now. So yeah. thank you. I'm honored that you guys listened today and I hope you have a great Labor Day weekend. <laughs>